There's nothing left Only thoughts And my heart Feeling numb Leaves me cold Makes me cry And I'm wondering why This love Is melting away All I ever wanted was to be your king, but you chose to abuse me. For you, I would have done anything. For that, you chose to use me. Abuse me with your tongue whips to keep my spirit enslaved. To ensure you didn't lose me, you used our two young kids to block my escape. My desire to be a good father, a story told to you long, long ago was all the firepower needed to conquer when it was time to go blow for blow. And you know every button to push, sometimes even 911. But today, instead of handcuffs, I've had enough. I'm done. Am I a victim? Frozen heartbeat. I became involved with uh, my ex-partner in 2010, and in mid-2011, we had two beautiful baby girls. We moved in together after they were born, and, well, that's when all of the problems began. The very first night she was there, she threw three or four unopened glass beer bottles in my direction because she thought I was drinking too much while trying to mount our new TV on our bedroom wall. I should have seen that as a sign of things to come. About another month later, we got into another argument and she was repeatedly shoving and scratching. She ripped open my shirt she tried to hold me hostage in my own apartment by not letting me go to work. So I called the cops. I was raised with strong moral beliefs, and one of them being a man should never hit a woman. When we first started dating, she stated that she was abused by her previous relationships. She became physically abusive in the early stages. I only thought this because that's all she'd known from her prior relationships. And I sadly thought, if I remain calm and that we had a discussion, she would change. I thought if I remain calm and took it, physical, emotional, and verbal abuse would, would stop. I would leave the house when an incident was about to happen or when it happened. But... I always went back. Are we becoming a nation of wimpy men? A man who allows a woman to physically or mentally abuse him deserves what he gets. If a woman comes at a man and is cursing and wants to fight, that a man has a right to defend himself. It's no wonder that men are in the situation. If they handled things like men and not like crying babies, then things would be a lot simpler. My manliness is not in my mind when it comes to my situation. The problem of what to do when my wife is getting hysterical is a genuine problem. And, you know, it might be hard to see through all the smoke and mirrors of men being abused by women, but it, it's, a, it's a real situation. It's very real. 
You know, usually an episode at my place starts with my wife, she's, she's tired, and then, you know, the verbal abuse starts, and, and she gets, she can get ticked off by even the most politely, you know, uh, stated questions or, or comments, and she either comes at me or she comes at our daughter. You know, sometimes I get physically abused, yes. She's kicked me in the back many times, and uh, she likes to destroy my stuff, any electronics I have. Uh, there's a time where she, you know, broke off a door uh, to my room because she claimed that I wasn't loving her. I've experimented with many different ways on how to handle the situation. Uh, I can if give a good answer of when questioned with, why don't you just yada, yada, yada to handle the situation? There's no real good answer. You could call the police. Uh, but, you know, she could tell them that you abuse her and they look at you. And when they arrived, she made up some story about how I was losing control and attacking her. So they arrested the both of us. The result of the arrest was a cross-limited order of protection, meaning we could live in the same house, just not fight, harass, etc. In the first couple of years, I called the police because I was afraid for my son's life and my own when she became violent. A police officer informed me that if, if I called the police station one more time, they'd have to inform the State Child Protective Agency and my son would be taken. Well, that was the last time I called the police for help. Well, look at, they would look at me in my situation, they look at me and not see a, a man who has a good job and owns the home, he just sees a, a black man in a domestic dispute. And if you're like me, then you, you're the one who gets locked up. Maybe she she admits to being the abuser and doing the things she does. And it's up to them. Maybe they lock her up, maybe they don't. I was pulled over by a police officer and stated that there was an arrest warrant out for, for domestic abuse. For me. And this was a curveball because being abused and never lifting a finger to her or any woman. About another month later, we got into another argument on the weekend of my birthday. All because she thought I was looking at another girl at a party. She goes completely ballistic. She punched me in the face. She gave me a fat lip and a bloody nose. My own friends had to hold her back. <sighs> another month or so goes by, get into another argument. And I try to leave, as I usually do when she gets upset. But she follows me to the car and prevents me from closing the car door. Some more shouting back and forth and she punches me in the mouth. So I push her away to try and close the car door and escape. And after I leave and she knows that I'm not around, she calls the cops and files another false police report. Out of nowhere, she started physically attacking me. I tried to run, but she kept blocking me. I tried to hide, but she broke the door to the bathroom and then broke down the bedroom door. I feared for my son's life, so I grabbed our sleeping son 
and held him in my arms while she was punching and biting me. I tried to leave the house, but she was still blocking me, so I ran with my son in my with our son in my arms to the car, but I couldn't leave because she had the car keys. So I held down the front the the car door, the lockdown, so she couldn't open the door with the key. And when she ran to the other side of the door, I held down the passenger lockdown. Depends on the situation. And there's a scenario where she she doesn't say anything at all. And no matter what you say or what you do, they won't take her. In horror and shock, I was booked. And while they were booking me, I had scratches on my face from when she was punching me with a ring. I had faded I had faded bruises on my back. So they took pictures of my arms, face, and back. And then she calls me to tell me that it was the neighbors who called the cops and that when they came by, she said nothing. So as a result, I got arrested. And I was told to stay away from my apartment and from my kids. Child services got involved and they're getting her all this help because she's a victim of domestic abuse. Family courts are only giving me supervised visits with my kids. Meanwhile, I'm sleeping on the floor of my mother's living room and I can't even go to the apartment that I pay the bills and I pay the rent on. People keep asking me why why I kept going back for six years. Well, the main reason is that she threatened to take my kids six hours away from me, making it extremely difficult for me to see them. But if you have children, do it for them. Do it for them, not yourself. It's still better than the result of trying to get a divorce for my daughter. For, for my daughter. I like to think that even if there's smallest shot that she could change, then I owe it to my daughters to give them both of their parents every day of their life. Every day, every week, Martha matures and the situation gets, gets better for her. Uh, at this point, she, she desperately needs her mother. And she needs her mother's approval. And I would judge that it would be worse to disturb that current relationship unless I had some assurance that she would not withdraw her love from her daughter. A few days before the trial, my lawyer told me that the police station lost the photos of my face, back, and arms. He also told me that they were gonna offer me a plea deal I could fight it, and if I lost, I face one year of prison. Every fiber of my being screamed. How is this an example that the truth will prevail and the innocent will not be proven guilty? How could God just be so unjust? How could I? Being a victim, be convicted of abuse. A few months later, my wife told me that she would, it would never happen again, so I went back. And she told me 
that she thought I was going to divorce her. So that's why she lied to the police. The abuse started with physical and emotional to financial, sexual, isolation, intimidation, and using our son. People think it's their fault because of problems that they did or didn't do. No one could or would love them. You become numb to it, but they try to find a new way to hurt you. I can't take this anymore. The abuse it's not just physical, it's psychological. Her constant suicide threats. She tried to hang herself in front of me once. They've taken a toll. Right now, she's back to her old tricks, trying to reel me back in, even though she tells the police that she's afraid of me. She's constantly texting me, leaving voicemails about how the kids are sick, or she thinks she's pregnant, or some other emergency to make me come back. And even though I'm not supposed to, I've caved a couple of times and I've gone. It's always nothing. But well, we still have, you know, we still have family gatherings and, you know, still have family time. And, and I just stay out of, out of the way. You know, I, I, I sleep on a cot in the basement. I've been there for five years sleeping on a cot and just listening to any signs of when she starts getting hysterical having an episode and uh, you know and if i find it's being de directed toward our daughter I, I i become a bullet shield if i'm labeled as a wimp for it so be it but i have more stamina than 99 percent of the men who are in this situation. And I will be willing to do this for 11 more years as I have done it for the past seven. Don't damn afraid, I see the signs. I think it's time I said goodbye. Wings of sorrow flying low, coming down to rape my soul. Angel awoken from a dream he looks out of his window 3 a.m what happened to the last two years running away curling up hiding no use just abuse he conceals his pain and horror Life could be so great without them. He got raped by his mother's boyfriend. You think I'm joking? Psh, I wish. Now he lives with strangers. They are right. He had the closet door taken off its hinges. He doesn't let anyone touch him. He swears to himself that if anyone touches him like that again, he will kill them. Thank you for uh, doing the interview here. 
um, in the outdoors. When I was a kid, I used to uh, play this creek. You know, I'd build dams and chase water skeeters. You know, it was a place where I could uh, get away from my grandmother and the uh, stresses of our household and where, you know, my exuberance wasn't a problem, uh, where I could be me. And I mean, it was one of the few places that I actually, you know, felt safe as a kid. I felt nourished and nurtured. Uh, for the first five years of my life, I lived with my grandmother and uh, my parents were having problems and my dad lived out of state. So while living with my uh, grandmother, um, I was repeatedly molested by her. The molest was it happened when, uh, when we were alone together in a room or when she gave me baths. Yeah. It's just really hard to say out loud. Uh, but uh, uh, what she would do is she'd, she'd masturbate me and uh, force me to nurse on her breast. Uh, my grandmother was a manipulator. Uh, you know, whenever we were together, it'd be my favorite candies or favorite TV shows. If me and my mother were to argue, she, she'd always take my side. There was this whole adoration. Uh, but, uh, you know, Tino was such a beautiful child, you know, and it felt good. But uh, I now know it was just a setup. <clears throat> The, uh, the incest came to an end when I was about five. And I was sitting on my grandmother's lap on her couch in her living room and uh, she used to wear these uh, pins or brooches on her dress. And uh, she had me sucking at her breasts and my mother came into the room and uh, my grandmother pulled my head, jerked my head away, and I ended up cutting my cheek on her brooch. I was crying. Uh, you know, my grandmother's dress was down to her waist, her, her bra was undone, you know. It was, I, uh, she said something to my mother. I, I didn't understand it, but uh, that was it. That was, she stopped. That was the end of the abuse. The, the summer my father came back into the picture, uh, we moved to Boston and uh, I was so happy to be living with him and to be away from her, you know, I just, I didn't forget what happened, I just, like I, I shut it away, the back of my mind, you know, I didn't want to think about it and I had this whole other life ahead of me now. You know, we used to live by uh, Fenway and I'd always be playing at the park. I'd be climbing trees. I, uh, I'd ice skate the creek in the winter. You know, it's, I was doing a lot of art and uh, spending a lot of time in the museums too. Uh, it wasn't until I was about 12 that uh, I ended up having to move back to my grandmother's neighborhood here. Two key events shaped my life. One was my father's death. When I was eight, he died in a fire. The other was this thing that happened with these two guys when I was 10. There were long periods of my life where I just put all of it on a shelf and said, I'm not gonna worry about this stuff. I shut it out. I didn't talk about it with anybody. At least not until I was 21 and had to face some tough choices. And then recently, it all came up again. Growing up, we lived a normal life. At least that's what I thought at the time. I have a brother who's two years older than me and three sisters. We were raised in San Francisco in the Mission District. We had my immediate family and an uncle. Everybody else was back in Mexico. My mother, she worked in a warehouse. 
She was tough, strong, hardworking. My dad. He was like a little god to me. I looked up to him so much. I never remember him working, but every night him and his friends would have a mariachi band over at the house. They played full-blown mariachi music. Not with the uniforms, but with the big bass guitarras, the renquitos, the trumpets, everything else. They just played for themselves. One night, my brother woke me up. I couldn't breathe, there was so much smoke pouring into the dining room where we slept. My brother tried to open the door because we heard some screaming coming from the other side. Right before passing out, a window broke and a fireman came through. I woke up in a hospital and my mother came in all bandaged up. I asked her where my father was and she said he was in a room down the hall. Later, in the hospital chapel, she told me and my brother that our father had died in the fire. Those screams I heard were of my father dying. From that moment on, I changed. I was so angry and withdrawn. I was hurt that my mother lied to me. It wasn't fair to blame my mother, but I did. I blamed Mexico, I blamed God, I blamed everybody. After the fire, I was so sick from all the smoke. I don't remember much of that period. It was all just a big fog. I do remember that I flunked the third grade. After my father died, everything in my family had changed. My mother worked two jobs to keep us in parochial school. We were left alone a lot. My brother was 10, and all of a sudden it was up to him to take over, to be like our parent. Our uncle who lived with us, he was from the old school, so he used a whip to discipline us. The bottom line is, my brother and I didn't have the father that we needed. I was little when it started. Four or five years old. My parents both worked all the time, and my dad's friend Mike would take care of us. He would take us to his house, but I thought it was out in the country. It had a few houses and a couple of trees. And that's where he started touching me. My parents both worked all the time, so they never had time for us. They were always relaxing, doing laundry, too busy making dinner. After Mike started touching me, he told me I couldn't tell anyone about it, that it was our special secret. I was so afraid. I'm afraid that if I told my parents, they'd be mad at me or even blame me. I was so afraid that I didn't say anything. And it just continued and continued. One day, a policeman came to the house and said he was investigating Mike. He asked me if he had touched me too. And up to this day, I still regret what I said. I said no. I think I protected him because the things he let me do, like taste beer, I even smoke cigarettes. I know I should have said something. Before it all started, I was a happy kid. But after Mike started touching me, my grades fell. I was just so broken. I didn't want the whole world to see what was going on wrong with me. I wanted them to see that I had it all together. But it didn't. I started doing drugs and drinking a lot. It even got to the point that I started to hurt myself. I was so confused about my own sexuality, about wanting to be with guys or girls. It was all too hard. Currently, my sister told me that Mike had taken advantage of her too. that really hit. I was mad and sad over the fact what had happened to her. What if I had said something earlier? I could have prevented that from happening. Soon after puberty, I felt this 
internal conflict and confusion with my sexuality. You know, if anything sexual happened, I, I felt this disassociation and fear. And I felt damaged and uh, unworthy. I, I felt that if, if I were to be in a relationship, it'd end up turning to be something damaging for her or for myself. Uh, so I had this dance where uh, there was a lot of seeking for affection and uh, chasing, but you know, I, I longed to be in a relationship, but uh, I would shy away as soon as it got past the holding hands. I just felt like I was out there alone, you know, just the stress was just really getting to me. I, I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown and I mean, I, I was having one. I, it, it came down to, it was you know, either suicide or calling the hotline, you know. But at, but at that time, <laughs> it felt better to me to commit suicide than to pick up the phone and to, to tell somebody that I have a problem. That uh, I'm having confusions and that the stress is just out of my control. And <laughs> Admitting to somebody that something's out of my control was more frightening to me than, than taking my own life. But I called. Hanging out in the streets, we started dibbling and dabbling with alcohol. We ran pretty wild. When I was 10, there was these two grown-ups who started hanging out with us, playing outdoor sports like stickball or yard games. They seemed like nice guys. Sometimes they would take me to a place, an apartment across town, where they had all these indoor games. There was hugging. There was a lot of warmth. When I was with them, I felt good about myself. Someone was caring about me, loving me. I thought it was okay, and it was fun. At that point, there were just guys who loved me. There was a lot of cuddling and caressing. In my family, we didn't hug that way, not this body-to-body -body stuff. I remember really trusting them. At that point, it was all good. And then it progressed. It went to two of us laying on the bed, hugging and rubbing, always with clothes on. One time with one guy, one time with the other. Then the last time, they were both there. What happened was, well, they held me down, and they stripped me, and they raped me. It hurt like hell. I was 10. I didn't understand what was going on. Afterwards, I went into the kitchen and I grabbed a knife. I came back and I stabbed one of them in the butt. I ran. It was the last time I saw them. I ran and I ran, trying to find my way home, but it was all the way across town, and I got lost. But eventually I made it. I never forgot what they did to me, but I didn't tell anybody either. I never told my mother because I thought it would completely devastate her, and I was afraid I'd get in trouble. I didn't understand why that happened to me. Here I was with these two guys, and they seem so nice, and they do that to me. I felt so bad. And then I realized this emotion I was feeling. Shame. That's what I felt, ashamed, embarrassed, humiliated. Recently, Mike got taken by the police. They said he had been 
abusing a lot of the kids in our neighborhood. Soon after then, I started to draw. It helped me a lot. It helped me express myself. I did it when I was alone, when I felt sad. It's hard. Sexual abuse is hard. Uh, when I was 16, I started drinking, mostly beer. I mean, it's a college town. It's not hard for a high school kid to get into fraternity parties. Uh, 17, I started drinking hard alcohol on a regular basis. Uh, you know, being able to be loud and obnoxious, it made me feel like this bigger person. Though on the inside, I smelled, I just felt like a small little child. I was, I was like 22 when I realized where I was headed with alcohol. Uh, I just, something snapped in me. I was just, ain't no way this, it's not the road I want to go down. So I quit drinking, but I, I started to starve myself. You know, I, I limited myself to 800 to 1,000 calories daily. I worked out two or three times a day. You know, it's, I was 165 pounds when I started or, uh, to quit drinking and I dropped down to 120. You know, I, it wasn't healthy. I, I was, it was a fanatic, really. And, uh, but the alcohol and the <coughs> anorexia really kind of served a purpose. It, uh, it kind of silenced the emotions. It, uh, it held a lid on top of uh, all the pain and the memories of molest that I had for several years. Uh, but when I quit, it was like I let all the lions and tigers out. You know, it, at first it, it felt really empowering, like. I was able to shout down anybody. Uh, I was controlling of other people. I was verbally abusive. Uh, at work, I became a bully. I, when I'd blow up, I, I, I felt powerful and uh, righteous, but afterwards I always felt ashamed and sad. Yeah. After that, I really started running the streets. I felt more anger, more hostility than before. Me and my friends, we started smoking dope. Then one of them introduced me into sniffing glue. <laughs> we ran amok. I was 14 when I first stuck a needle in my arm. I was hanging out with these kids from my street and they were shooting up speed. They were further into drugs than me and I was always that kid they tried to wave off. At 16, I was knee deep in heroin. Heroin's a good reliever for pain. And I used it to block out all of the emotional pain from what I went through. My father dying, being sick from the fire, the molestation, the rape. I didn't talk to anybody about my feelings. I didn't think I needed to. Instead, Trying to block it all out, I got addicted to heroin. Once you're addicted, the drug takes over. It becomes about not wanting to feel sick. And that's what happens when you can't get the drugs. You start going through withdrawals. All of a sudden, you're leading a life of crime. Stealing to get money, to buy the drugs, to stop from feeling sick. It's all about survival. And once it's about survival, you don't feel things like guilt, shame, or remorse. That stuff comes later. When I was 18, I got this girl pregnant. I was told if I didn't marry her that I'd never see my child. I really wanted to be a good dad. So during the whole pregnancy, I stopped using I got a good job cleaning tanks, working for the government, making good money. 
the night my, my son was born, I was hanging out with some partners in front of my mom's house. We were smoking dope. Then somebody pulled out some heroin and boom, I was off. Once I started using again, I couldn't stop. From 18 to 21, I went kind of crazy. I don't know how many times I overdosed. I was in and out of jail, trying to make my marriage work, but I couldn't stop using heroin. Then my grandmother died. Uh, she was going through her third recurrence of cancer. Uh, she was on mega doses of morphine. I went and visited her in the hospital, but it was, it was out of a sense of obligation. Uh, my sister was in the room with me, uh, but she dozed off. So I was the only person to witness my grandmother's passing. It was actually something else. It was pretty spooky. Um, I felt such sadness though, like, you know, sorrow for her condition, but I felt sad because I'd never have the opportunity to express to her, you know, the pain and the shame of the molest, you know. We'd never be able to resolve that face to face now, and uh, that opportunity was gone. Uh, But, you know, I uh, had this, a few months later, I had this dream. Woke up in sheer terror, just upright in my bed. I was quivering, I was drenched in sweat. I, I was screaming, no. Uh, my, my grandma had this walking cane and she'd always stir up trouble with it. Uh, but in the dream, she was approaching me and poking me with it and I, I took it from her and I break it over my knee and I threw it back at her. And I screamed, no, you know, as, as to her as I, as I woke up. You know, and uh, the dream used to startle the hell out of me. I was in an antique shop and I saw this picture that had the same detail as the wallpaper in my grandmother's room. You know, it was this idyllic scene, uh, a farmhouse, tilled hills, uh, apple trees, there's a guy riding a tractor. Uh, when I saw it, it was like instantaneous reaction. I thought I was going to throw up right there on the spot. I just became flooded with this panic and terror, you know, the same feelings I felt when I was a kid. Uh, I felt hopeless, helpless. I, I, did, I just didn't know what was going to happen next. I, uh, my body started having these sensations, like felt like I was going to vomit you know, pur to purge myself. I felt like this panic in my pelvic area. I just. I just wanted to curl up in bed and throw the covers over my head and I, I just didn't want to see anybody. I, uh, I had shut this door to my grandmother's room in my head and just seeing this picture just like let it all fall out again. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't call the hotline this time, uh, though I was having a classic mental breakdown or breakthrough as I now come to see it. You know, I, I now knew that I, I needed help and I, I needed to talk about the incest and therapy. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't just go to any therapist though. I, uh, I called up a friend who was a, also a molest survivor and I asked for a recommendation. You know, I, I felt comfort and knowing that they trusted him. Right. I felt really nervous sitting in the waiting room though, because he's local and I I knew someone was gonna come in and just see me there and 
But at that point, I knew I knew it had to be done. So I, 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 um, I interviewed him. He interviewed me. You know, he pretty much told me uh, straight up, I don't know how far I'm going to be able to go with you on this, but if you're willing to try, I'm willing to try. And I just felt this affinity, a trust from that moment on. Like I, I could finally tell somebody my story. You know, I, I could talk to him about all of the pain and the vile, horrific things that happened. And, and I knew he was there for me. Like he never shied away. Looking back, I should have been more honest about what was going on with me and those guys. Not kept secrets from my mother. But they said, don't tell anybody. What was so tragic is I was repeating a lot of the mistakes my father did, and I didn't even know it. I mean, with the alcohol, the drugs. I was violent. If my wife looked at anybody else, I would slap her. My mother, she would look to me and say, Mijo, don't treat your wife the way your father treated me. There are some things in my life that I'm not so proud about. Things got worse before they got better. My wife had enough and she left me for good. I was 21 and had something like 30 arrests. At 21, I was convicted for possession of heroin and possession of stolen property. They wanted to send me to the state penitentiary for two to tens running wild, which means two consecutive sentences. That's four to 10 years in prison. I was really lucky though. I had a lawyer from Mission Legal Defense. It's a group of lawyers who helped impoverished people. He made it to where I had a choice, go to the joint or go into a residential treatment program. I chose rehab, but at first they wanted to send me to a place for hardcore addicts and criminals. Deep inside, despite everything I had done, I knew that wasn't me. So my lawyer found a spot for me at Walden House. And that's where I went, straight from county jail. The deal was, I had to do a program and stay clean for five years or I'd end up back in jail. Walden House is a 24-hour live-in therapeutic community. Back then, it was a big, beautiful Victorian home. They had group therapy, one-on-one -on -one counseling, family therapy. The residents, they handled a lot of the programs back then. I mean, we ran service crews, drove vehicles, manned the phones, we cooked. It was a learning process. They call it rehabilitation, but some of us didn't have the skills to begin with. So it was more like habilitation. In essence, I grew up there. I found out that there was some people out there who went through a lot worse than me. And that no matter what you went through, heroin, speed, molestation or rape, committing crimes or being the victim of a crime, somebody there could relate to it. Coming down to rape my soul, angel camouflage, vulture soaring, I'm waiting for the blow, oh and I... Mother, may I ask you why you left us with him? Why you left us at night? Why you left us in Winter Garden? Were you doctoring your diagnosis? Mother, may I ask why you expected light from a man who blackened your eyes? Why you expected ours to be anything other than underlined in dark circles from listening to Jimi, Jimi Hendrix skip on the record player, which could only mean one thing? Weren't you experienced? Mother, may I ask how frigid it felt to be given time? with a cold ear to shoulder, with hand to head freshly shaven. The neighbors always talked about how beautiful your hair was, and I have been told that power grows in it, but 
That saying never met you. Never knew what fearless in a freckled five foot four frame embodied or what justice in the principal's office looked like, sounded like, when corporal punishment was suggested. You were all March, single file style. Mother, may I thank you for the rainy season trips to the library and the Oldsmobile, for being greeted with off-brand Oreos and Tropical Splash Kool-Aid, for homework till it was A work, for summers spent outside, for video games only on the weekends, for stapling all the pages in the house into a makeshift book so I could fill the pages. You lifted me up. You lift me up higher than when you threw me to him in the waves. You are a mermaid, a creature that visits only in vision, a siren singing Janis Joplin off key. Mother, may I mourn you? The person you were and weren't, the surfer beneath the soldier, the gypsy beneath the bandana, the hippie beyond conventional wisdom, the free spirit genied in parenthood grant me the ability to forgive you. And when I compare myself to as a parent to do so without bias, to see the beauty stemming within the faults, to recall more than the trauma. My white fist clenches into a tight ball and smashes the face of my eight-year-old brown-skinned boy over and over and over. His hot tears stream down from his shit brown eyes. His lip splits like the horsehide of a much too worn baseball, revealing damaged and discolored yarn inside. His trickling blood feeds the river of my rage, but cannot assuage or wash away the sins of his father. So I, I want to start by addressing the elephant in the room. Why am I concealing my identity? I'm out as a gay man, and even in Modesto, I feel pretty safe being out. But to come out as a survivor of domestic violence? Frankly, that just scares the shit out of me. There are so many expectations around what it means to be a man, even a gay man and so much stigma and shame around being a victim of abuse. And I just can't do it. When I was 20, I met Rob at the only gay bar in town. The power imbalance was immediately evident. I was chubby and insecure, and I was definitely not out. He was four years older, and by contrast, he was openly gay. He, was admired for his looks and his personality. He couldn't do enough for people and everybody loved him. I have to admit, I was flattered that Rob paid attention to me and wanted to date me at the beginning of our relationship. It was, it was overwhelming. I thought, how lucky am I? I found the one. On a scale of one to 10, my confidence back then was about a three. When I was with him, I felt good about myself. Everywhere we went in the small gay community, people liked him, and they liked me because I lived off of his reflected glory. We moved in together pretty quickly. We set up a makeshift gym in the garage to throw the neighbors off. They thought we were college roommates. We lived just a few blocks down from MJC. One night, we had some of Rob's friends over. We were working out and drinking beer. I didn't know that two of the guys were Rob's former lovers, and one of them was his ex. They sneaked off for a while, so I went to find out what was going on. 
And that's when Rob told me that uh, he'd been involved with him in the past. I was hurt and heartbroken. We started to argue. Rob told me to shut up or he would shut me up. But I didn't shut up. I wanted an explanation. He started lashing out. I said I was embarrassing him in front of his friends. Then he punched me and threw me to the ground. Started kicking me. He was six foot three and pretty buff. But I got up and I tried to fight back. I threw a punch and he ducked. My hand went through a window. Shards of glass are stuck in my wrist. Things got out of hand and the neighbors called the police. <laughs> when the police arrived, they didn't seem to think it was much. It wasn't very serious to them. They asked, so he's your boyfriend, huh? So you guys are gay, huh? I needed some sympathy and to know that I was going to get some support, but it was not there. They told us to keep it down and they left. At that point, I didn't know where to go for help. I was still suffering from so much shame around my sexuality. No one except for Rob's friends even knew I was in a gay relationship. Not even my mom. And when you feel like you have no support, no one to talk to, you start to think that maybe this is the normal. After my experience with the not-so-gay friendly police, I didn't feel like I could rely on the law to protect me anymore. One of the cops actually said to me, You can take it. You're a man. Hit him back next time, but don't miss. Man up. But I could see him laughing with the other officer as he walked away. I had never had so much shame about my masculinity. It was humiliating. For two more years, and the violence got worse. Finally, out of fear for my life, I left. I waited until Rob was at work. I packed some belongings, and I left. I went into hiding. I changed my phone number, stopped going to the bar, severed contact with the gay community. But it didn't work. He found me. He'd send me flowers and letters saying he was sorry and that he was entitled to another chance. I lived in fear for another year and became a recluse. I only left my house to go to work. Finally, I heard that Rob had met someone and had moved to the city. It was only then that I could begin to heal and reclaim my life. I was um, three months pregnant when my girlfriend Lynn raped me. We were home and uh, she wanted sex, but I didn't. So I told her no. She got <laughs> nasty and she's a lot bigger than me physically so when I told her no she uh, pinned me against the doorway and said I will get what I want when I fucking want it so she assaulted me Lynn uh, she wasn't always like that uh, she wooed me. <laughs> Her attention was nice. She was very uh, exciting and and romantic. Like she would, uh, she would send me these uh, endless loving messages and and emails. Some with even poetry in it. I remember thinking, uh, I was so grateful to have someone be interested in me. Even if a little tiny part of me was afraid of her. After, uh, after I became pregnant, uh, I grew uh, isolated from my friends. They would uh, go out clubbing or because I was pregnant, um, they wouldn't see me as 
a real lesbian. What they didn't know was that uh, I had brief briefly prostituted myself to survive financially. But Lynn knew. And she would use that as the stick to beat me with every day. She would uh, call me a slut and a whore. You know, uh, looking back, um, there was a lot that wasn't normal about our relationship. Um, she gave me a, a contract, sexual contract with a list and boxes next to them saying, um, if you would ever, have you ever done, if you would let me do, it was pretty much just a horrible version of Fifty Shades of Grey. She, uh, she even controlled what clothes I wore. She wanted me to be a uh, feminine, and if I even dressed up remotely butch, she would uh, grab me and say, what, you're trying to be butch now? Look at me. I am butch. I am butch. And then uh, she would slap me. If I were to uh, cry, she would berate and belittle me and call me a joke, a weakling, a baby. When, uh, when someone says that to you every day, you, uh, you erode. And I fell apart. The um, final straw was um, one night she wanted to tie me up for fun, she said. Um, she uh, stuck needles in me, and then uh, she held a, a knife to my throat, held it there. Um, I don't know uh, how I managed to get away, but I did. Even the cops were called. But, uh, they didn't do anything. They didn't even arrest Lynn. After that, um, everything was over. People would ask me why I, uh, didn't seek help sooner. But I did. I, I, uh, I tried. Um, I went on this, uh, Women's Refuge website. And as I was reading it, it kept saying, um, if uh, he did this, or if he would do this, if he, just, <laughs> he, it was, uh, it was all male terminology, and that was an instant barrier. I mean, here I was, sneaking around on my computer, while my abuser was in the bathroom, and uh, that was when I realized that um, this doesn't happen in relationships like this. This was strictly a heterosexual problem. So I turned it off and became silent. Growing up, you know, as a gay man, you really never had that much, you know, support, you know, and respect from your family and friends. And then, you know, you start getting self-doubt, not knowing what to do with your life. Not only like I've been, you know, abused mentally, physically, I've never knew that this would happen in my life. You know, let's just say when I was 25 years old, never been in a relationship, N you know, wasn't really looking for anything, you know, just there hanging out with my friends. 
and that, and then like no one really takes interest in you, you know, for being, you know, like overweight, a drag queen, you know, and stuff like that. But the night that the night that I met my partner, my ex partner, he w he was something. He took interest in me. He couldn't stop smiling every time he seen me. And at the point, you know, I really wasn't interested in him. He was kind of like goofy, dorky looking. I ended up taking him home, just thinking it was, you know, just for sex. No, it wasn't. We ended up talking most of the all night, and then we made it official. You know, he was making me laugh, smile, everything that I wanted. You know, this what basically happens. You know, when you are desperate. And you would do anything to be in a relationship, not knowing what this person has to offer or what he can do for you or not to do for you. He, you can say he was a special type of person. He kept me laughing. And then within, mo within a month and a half, he moved into my place where I was living at. Our roommates told us we need to come up with money for rent. You know, they told they told me I have to do what I have to do. I didn't want to because I've just gotten this relationship. So basically, they forced me to do what I have to do. And I didn't tell my partner at the time. And then, you know, we end up being homeless regardless. Couch surfing, house to house. And then one day, I just, I was so mad, I just wanted to get away from everyone. He comes walking behind. He said something to, thinking, trying to make me laugh, but it didn't work. I just wanted to leave me alone. You know, I just need to be alone for a minute. And then he tries, he tries to stop me from walking. Yes, it was my fault. I knew it was my fault from the be from the beginning. I knew I should not have done this. Yes, I did slap him, but it was just me being so mad at the time, and I regret it ever since then. I did that because I'm not that type of person. And then he he forgave me. Then. We end up moving in with my parents, thinking things were going to get better. They, they did in the beginning. And then he ends up getting a job. And then we end up moving into our own place. And the beginning was fine, and then all of a sudden, things just start getting worse and worse and worse. I don't know why. You know, I, I was doing everything for him, everything. I cooked, I cleaned, I did everything. And then whatever money I made on stage, I gave, like, you know, from performing, I gave it to him to pay rent, pay electricity bill, everything. Not knowing what he was doing behind my back, you know. And then he ends up having, um, he ends up, you know, cheating on me regardless, blames everything on me from the day that I slapped him. That's my fault that things went sour. It's my fault that, you know, it's just, he just, whatever thing, whatever thing he could find, he just blames it on me. And then just got me thinking, I'm like, like what's, like what's wrong with me? What if, like, what have I done? Everything I've been doing for him, you know, showing him that, that I care for him, you know, you, you know, when he gets off of work, he just basically ignores me. And, you know, he sticks with his video games or he goes out, he goes to a friend's apartment, you know. 
And then all of a sudden, it just got worse from there. It just got worse. The first time we had a really bad experience of arguing, and we were just, it was like we were arguing, and then all of a sudden, he grab he grabs me, puts me in a chokehold. Well, bear hold. Uh, he said bear. Uh, bear head. Yeah, he, like a bear chokehold. That really scared me. I was like, "What can I do?" Then I pulled the knife out. Well, somehow, 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 some way, I got out of it, out of that hold. Then go in the kitchen, grab the knife, put it against my throat. All he did is just walked out of the house. And me yelling at him, just like, why, why did you walk out of the house? He's like, I don't want to see it. I don't want, I don't want to be near it. And then... Things started getting worse. Him not really giving me any attention that I needed from him. He basically just ignored me, just playing his video games, hanging out with his friends, being on the phone all the time. Basically, you can say I was being neglected, rejected. You know, never really felt that connection anymore and then me trying to do whatever I can do to keep that love but all ends up you know him ignoring me and just like pushing me to the side like I wasn't important anymore then things started getting worse every time we get in an argument he will basically put me in like in a bare chokehold you know at that time, you never imagined that someone that you love will ever do that thing to will ever do that to you, will ever make you feel helpless, useless. Then, starting in really bad depression, started having suicidal thoughts. He didn't care. All he cared about was his video games, smoking weed, hanging out with his friends, and basically you know cheating on me that's like the worst feeling he didn't care he he just don't he just didn't want to be a part of it you know he didn't i just felt so unloved so disrespected so hurt from him of what he was doing to make me feel this way we got in an argument then all of a sudden you know he just yelled and yelled. Then the after we were done arguing, and after all, um, after our friends left, we were asleep. I, you know, never. I can never imagine him doing this to me. Ever like in a million years, never expected him to do this. After what we went through that day, we, we were just laying there, we passed out, and then all of a sudden, he puts a pillow over my head, and he sexually abused me, raped me, after, I, after everything I did for him. Just like, why me? Why, why, you, why you have to do this to me? And then, you know, the next day, I ended up, didn't talk to anybody, didn't want to tell anybody what happened. That's my own fault. I hated myself ever since then. Oh, and I am well aware of what is heading straight toward me. I am no longer a victim. I have always hated that word. I am now a survivor. 
The road from one to another was a long journey, which has no end, only new beginnings. A victim lives in fear. A survivor endures. A victim is weak and powerless, pain for what was not her doing. A survivor grows strong because she knows the price is not hers to pay. The sin is not hers to atone. God will extract the price from the right person on the day that no lie can be told. So do not call me a victim. I have always hated that word. I am a survivor. All in all, I'm amazed how nobody's willing to listen to me. Not the police, not child services, not anybody. I have all of these incriminating texts and vo a recording of a voicemail saying how that the incident that she reported to the police didn't go down the way she says it went down. But nobody's willing to listen to me. Why? It would be just sufficient to stay and be a good father. Or at least try to be as good a father as I can be to her. So I'm going to stay in this situation. And if you think it's suicide, then maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It remains to be seen. For 12 years, I was married and abused by my now ex-wife. I'm a survivor, not a victim. After all the abuse was done, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. I was a wreck with nothing. Eating, sleeping, functioning in life was a challenge. I'm lucky that I found a counselor to help save me from myself. You know, the world is still under this perception that a man is in control and how could a woman ever abuse a man? And I just hope that I can help someone and be an inspiration to someone in need. I reclaimed my sexuality by being in a relationship with someone that is open, honest, you know, and uh, direct, you know. I've I've, I mean, I've never been more in love than I've ever been with anybody, you know, than I am with my wife, Carla. Yeah, she, you know, we don't, we don't push for intimacy or, you know, if, if someone is uncomfortable and something happens that reminds them of a past incident, we, we stop and we talk about it. You know, I, you know, I could say I'm feeling afraid because when you, touch me like that, it brings up a, a piece of the molest. And we'd comfort each other and console each other. Uh, you know, it's, there's this compassion and this strong bond. You know, it was, when we, when we are, you know, sexual with each other, there's this connection and, and there's all this trust, you know, and we, we go through you know, to all these painful places, but we have even more joyful ones. You know, and there's this mutual respect for each other, and that's, it's just really strong. Uh, it's, now sex is nurturing to me. I, I'm, I'm, I feel safe. I don't feel like I'm gonna hurt anybody. I don't feel like I'm gonna hurt her. And uh, it's pretty spiritual now. I've learned to balance work, family life, quiet time, and the spiritual side. By spiritual, I don't mean God. For me, it's not about religion. But I did find a group of Buddhists chanting, and that helped a lot. If we stop now, the story would be, this guy got himself into recovery, pulled his life together.
But that's not where the story ends. In reality, if you don't take care of yourself and find balance in your life, you'll lose yourself. I had to go to more counseling to dig deeper about the sexual abuse, to understand it, to get over it. Sometimes the rage is still there inside of me. But I've learned how to express it in a way that doesn't hurt anybody. I now go to Alcoholics Anonymous and do a 12-step program for substance abuse. And I have a sponsor. And that's really important, working the steps. And I'm not saying that everybody needs residential treatment but you have to have a program and work it. I got myself back on my feet. I managed to graduate. I mean, I still don't know what I want to do with my future, but I'm doing something. Hopefully, in sometime in the future, I can go to college and get an education. I just don't know. This abuse stuff is pretty hard. I'm happy where I'm at now. <laughs> I, you know, I'm still hitting that stage, performing my butt off, making people happy and smile. That's all, that's all that matters right now, and still continuing on with life. Man, I wish I could go back, talk to myself at that age. I would say if someone treats you like that, it isn't love, and it's not normal. I wish I had known how to love myself back then. But my story ends on a positive note. I met my life partner two years after Rob left. We've been together for over 25 years in a happy, healthy relationship. My guy is the only one who knows what I'd been through until now. What I realize now is that the uh, silence in domestic violence of LGBTQ relationships is a silence of shame. We're so used to being bullied in schools and so used to domestic violence being defined as a male-female dynamic and so used to not having discussions about domestic violence in the LGBTQ community that it all feels like a conspiracy of silence. As I've come to realize and grow my self-esteem and realize that I am worthy of love that isn't transactional or conditional, I've grown weary of the silence. It doesn't matter what people say or act towards me or how they see me as I found my voice. If I had any advice to say, I'd say this. You might think you're the only one, but you're not. You have to say something. Don't keep quiet. Break the silence. There will come a day when tears of sorrow flow into tears of remembrance, and your heart will begin to heal. Your grief will be soothed by moments of joy and whispers of hope. There will come a day when you will welcome tears of remembrance as a rainbow of the soul, as a turning of the tide, and as a promise of peace. There will come a day when you will begin to live forward, to find a new normal, and to treasure each tear.